true history of materialism. Where does materialism come from? What is it? Where is it going? We begin from an antiquity that is characterized by poetic wisdom or the wisdom of poets. Poets as founders of political order, of a city. The paradigmatic poet in Greek is Orpheus, mythical figure of a founder of order, a civilizer, a man who turns brutes into citizens, who civilizes passions, moderates passions, and turns them toward a common good. The poetic wisdom of the ancient city is not much of a comfort to certain poets, poets who are not uh, in the position of Orpheus. They are not conformists. They do not simply follow the ways of the founders of the polis. They seek the origins of poetic wisdom. So they depart from the ways of the city. They go into a realm which they call nature, fuses. And in this realm, they find, or they seek at any rate, freedom. They seek truth. This realm is characterized by, well, what is indefinite or even infinite. The apeiron as opposed to what is finite, what is defined, which is what is of the character of laws, really, of poetic laws, of poetic wisdom. And so what is within the city? Within the city we have the peros, the finite, finitude, and outside of the city we have wilderness, we have the indefinite, we have even the void as an important philosopher, a first philosopher, uh, would uh, point out, he would say that reality is nothing more than the void and, well, atoms. Now, if we consider this formulation carefully, we will see that early materialism is not at all what it is usually or conventionally taken to be. What is the atom of early materialists, or so-called materialists? What is the void of, of, of ancient materialism? Well, the void is, first of all, absolute, which is to say, is complete emptiness. Now, absolute void, of course, is spaceless. It is boundless. If it does not contain anything at all, if it is absolutely void, then it is nowhere. It cannot be measured. It is not of the nature of what is tangible, shall we say. It is not anywhere. If it is not anywhere, it is what we ordinarily consider as mind. Now, however, what is the atom? The atom is something that cannot possibly be divided it is the fundamental uh, sometimes we could say constituent of all finite things beings entities however now the atom cannot be divided so it is nowhere to be found it is nowhere in time or space as we uh, might um, say today so the atom is not a physical entity neither is of course, the absolute void. So when Democritus and others will say that reality, or they we could say reality, so all that there is boils down to the void and atoms, or atoms in the void, what he is saying is that we have determinations that are in nature, which is ultimately, well, um, a space, that is spaceless, in other words, a form. 
So we have form and content. The content is determinations, and the indeterminate is the void. So that is what we have. Now, there is a contrast between the two, and the ancient philosopher chooses the void as opposed to the atoms, clearly. First philosophers, philosophers of nature, choose the indefinite, aperon, to the peros, the finite, the definite, the legal. So they go for nature as opposed to law. Fine. In comes Socrates, who responds, incidentally, to one of these philosophers of nature, Anaxagoras, who had pointed out that all comes from the void, and he had characterized the void as mind. Mind. This was quite intriguing to the young Socrates. Mind was the source now of all of these atoms in the void. Somehow the atoms came from all determinations, come from mind. So, right? Mind is not simply there indifferently. It is not there uh, without any link to the atoms, to determinations. Therefore, we can ask the question of mediation. How does mind come to produce the atoms? Anaxagoras did not say. He said, well, you know, everything comes from mind, but he didn't really articulate the question that Socrates raises. The fundamental question for Socrates is not the void on its own, but the question of mediation. And for Socrates, there is a hidden mediation. So when the ancient poets spoke of gods, Socrates says, well, that's not altogether wrong. In fact, for Socrates, Homer was fundamentally, if only in a serious way, right. It turns out that the gods are hidden forms, form, content. The universal form that the materialists had referred to now is really within, hidden within finitude, within the peros. Within the peros, we find gods, or rather, within the nature of the peros. The finite being contains a kind of hidden infinity, an infinity that is at work within the finite. And so eventually, Aristotle will speak about uh, an energy that is, by definition, within a work within the work. So there is a hidden agency within ordinary work, within ordinary dynamics. Okay. Now, this is intriguing. Socrates raises this question of mediation, but it re mediation is understood as something strictly hidden, something that the philosopher must turn to without being able to bring this out, establish it on the plane of the finite within the city. So the wisdom of the city fails to grasp this mediation. The city remains at odds with this hidden mediation. Socrates is inevitably sacrificed. The city, once I'm dead, he is a scapegoat for Athens.
Christianity is, in its advent, in its teachings, crucial to our understanding of the fate, we could call it the fate of materialism. What does Christianity teach us? Christianity, of course, is the doctrine of, the consummate doctrine of mediation. Christianity teaches universal mediation. It reveals the mediation that is at work between the indefinite and the finite, between nature and law. And of course, the Gospels insist upon this point uh, with relentlessly. Um, what is at stake is the inherence of the principle of law, or even of law itself, within human nature. The divine within the human, ultimately. This is key to the rise of the human within the divine. So we have a dialogue here between the human and the divine. This dialogue is revealed in the person, of course, of the Christ, who is perfect man, and therefore perfect poet, perfect or true Orpheus. He is a first philosopher prior to first philosophers. So we could say that first philosophers stand somehow to Christ as the second, well, as the first Adam stands to the second Adam. So Christ being the second Adam. Christ is not a philosopher of nature. He is a philosopher in nature. So he is a thought not about nature. It is not thought that turns toward nature, but a thought that is at work originally within nature. A thought that therefore is, we can say, divine. The origin of this thought of nature is therefore shown to be, with Christianity, the thought of nature, in nature. God's book of nature in the sense of being in nature, in other words, it belongs to nature. God's book is nature, and... God is reading it prior to our reading it. God is reading it from within. We read it from without. In other words, we return to God's own reading. We partake in God's reading. We partake in uh, the divine mind. This reading, that is God's own reading, is what is mediating the relationship between nature and law. This mediation is key to the Socratic life. It is also key to understanding first philosophy, the, the philosophy of, well, what we can call the philosophers of nature or materialists. Now, this revelation of mediation as a universal opens the door, one might say ironically, to a modern, what is here called final solution. What is the modern solution to the problem raised by Socrates, the problem involving the tension between first philosophers and, well, uh, convention, uh, conforming to convention, poetic wisdom, the, the wisdom of the city. The modern world arises there where 
the philosopher of nature sees Christianity as the vehicle for announcing, for determining, for spreading the news of the wisdom of ancient materialism. How does this work? With modern man, what we have is a revelation, a revelation of mediation in terms of a machine, the mediation of the machine. In nature, we do not have a philosopher. What we have is a machine. What does this mean? We could say the absence of philosophy. Nature is characterized by the radical absence of philosophy. What does this mean? How is this materialism? How is this something that differs from ancient materialism, for instance. If we say that mediation is a fundamental problem, it has been exposed by Socrates, and then finally, but still hidden, uh, finally with Christianity. If the, uh, um, the ancient materialist is confronted now, and he cannot escape this, with the problem of mediation, what is he going to do? He still wants to go into the void. He still wants this ancient freedom away from the laws. What is he going to do? He says, well, he cannot account for this tension, this mediation between the uh, aperon and the peros. Christianity had accounted for it. He can't. So he'll have to face that problem, the problem of mediation. Now, can he read, can he show that the mediation between these two poles, even nature and law, chooses nomos, is devoid, is a problem, but is devoid of philosophy. In other words, that somehow it is determined by nature itself. How can this be possible? I mean, ultimately, there was this rift, this radical rift between the two. Well, he'll have to say that somehow nature transforms itself into finity. That somehow it evolves, as we say, that it progresses, it advances into the formation of the production of atoms. These atoms there are not just simply there uh, eternally. They have to be somehow measurable. Somehow we have to have an art that measures the distance between the void and uh, the, the atoms without the need for philosophers. So without mind, we could say without thinking, without, uh, without a, a poetic agency, what is it that characterizes mediation ultimately? It is a language of mathematics, um, a machine, mechanical, mechanistic language, that will allow us to measure the distance between the void and the atoms, and then once this distance is measured, so it is accounted for in mechanistic terms, we can thereby begin a journey back to the void. We can see all atoms in the light of the void. We can see all things in the light of this original freedom. And therefore, we open the door to a return to the void, which is to say, ultimately, to uh, 
this, what at any rate for Socrates is the dream of universal freedom, which the ancient philosophers sought in private as pilgrims, as solitary, monastic philosophers. This is what the modern world offers us, the final solution to that problem, the problem fundamentally of mediation. How are we to understand the mediation between these two poles? Are we to understand it in Christian terms? No. We are to understand mediation not in terms of Christ, perfect man, but in terms of a machine. And here we have the revelation of modern man, of modern rationalism, as we would call it. And this machine will grant us universal coexistence. It will allow us to exist, everyone together here, which is to say philosophers, non-philosophers, the city and the scientist can coexist within the machine. So we'll all work together for the rise of this machine, which will serve as a vehicle for a return to nature, a return to a void. Through a reading of the eros of finite being in terms of indeterminate being. So, uh, essentially, in the light of what is destructive of the city. The city has to be understood in terms of what is destructive of the city, what precedes the, the, the rise of the city, of political order. And this through a mechanistic, mathematical, modern mathematical uh, language. And it's tools, the tools that that are produced uh, th through uh, that language. So, mediation here arising out of strife, atom versus void. What does this mean? Mediation between nature and law is the product not of thought, but of a conflict that is incarnated somehow by the new language, the language of modern mathematics, which is a language of zero one, the digital language of oppositions that involve conflict, strife. There is a conflict between the zero and the one, the yes and the no, true, false. This micro-conflict is at work in resolving the problem of coexistence. The strife, which is essential to the modern language, is to be the solution to peace. We are to seek peace through war. War is the foundation of peace. This, in brief, is the character of the modern project. And it aims at establishing this universal peace or a final solution based on strife, based on war. What does this translate into in uh, conventional language? It translates into a uh, final conflagration. We will have a total war that will bring a final peace. So here we find the consummation of materialism. We will find, all of us will find universal freedom in a return to an original void.